I'm a commercial beekeeper and I got my start back in 1990. There's many different issues that are facing bees and beekeepers today. So we're really looking for solutions and what can we do to maintain honey supply for our country and build up bees to pollinate all the crops that use our bees, all these different fruit crops and vegetables that need our bees to actually produce a profitable crop. I work for the Bee Informed Partnership, which is a national initiative to lower colony losses. I am also a PhD student at the University of Minnesota in entomology. Since the year 2006, beekeepers have been reporting higher winter losses, which is a concern because bees are so important to our agricultural system. And what a lot of them have been telling me is that they have been having to put a lot more into their bees to keep them alive than they used to. So there's been a lot of speculation about what is going on with bees, but really there are three big, what we call the P's of possible causes for these issues with honeybees. Pathogens and pests, poor nutrition, and potentially pesticides. So we have quite a bit to learn about them, and in different situations, bees may die of different things, but it's really important that we understand all the interactions that are possibly going on to help solve the bee crisis. I've been an independent crop consultant for about 33 years. First thing that always gets pointed at is farm production, modern farm production. Fingers get pointed there first because those hives are in our ecosystem. And, you know, we need to try and understand everything that's going on in that ecosystem. North Dakota is a uh, honey producing state. We're also a corn producing state. Uh, corn does not need the honeybees. Even though I don't rely on the honeybee as a day-to-day -day job, agriculture being what it is, and the chemicals and the insecticides, pesticides that we use, uh, anyway, if they are harmful, uh, I want to be shown that and so that we can correct what we're using so that it is not uh, a hindrance to the bees. The Bee Understanding Project that I'm participating in and the job swap, I think is going to be a real good eye opener for folks that are not familiar with the planting process on the farm. Uh, when I go to Texas to see how the bees are moved around, I don't even have the slightest clue of what I'm going to see or what part takes. All I'm hoping for is I don't get stung a bunch of times. I'm really looking forward to the job swap because you know, getting together with uh, farmers and seeing what's going on in their day-to-day -day life and in their operations, the challenges that they have. And that way we just get a good understanding of each other's positions and then help minimize exposure for pollinators. Well, you must be Randy. Yep. Hey. Carson, Carson. Klosterman. Randy Burhook. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Have a seat. All right. So Randy, tell me about the bee operation you have. Well, right now I'm running in a triangle. So we, we're based out of just southwest of Houston, Texas. We bring bees up to North Dakota and produce honey. Then we bring them back to Houston for the winter. Then we ship them out to California to pollinate almonds and then back to Houston and it's, uh, just do that triangle. Yep. So what are we gonna be doing today? On the schedule for today, we'll start out just like Every morning we do during the planting season. Uh, we got the semi here. We'll load that up with fertilizer. We put a little fertilizer down in furrow with the corn seed. And then we'll stop at the uh, seed dealership where we buy our seed from. We put a treatment on it. And what that is, a, it's a seed emergence aid. The seed already has a treatment on it from the factory, which deals with the insects in furrow. And what we're going to put on is a seed emergence aid. I think a lot of the questions are from the treatment that's already present on the seed. Hey Katie, what's going on? Hey Randy, good to see you. Long time no see. Yeah, yeah, good to see you guys. All right. 
Starson. This is uh, Katie Lee from the University of Minnesota and the Bean Farm Partnership. Nice to meet you, Katie. Nice to meet you, Carson. We've been working together for the last several years, uh, you know, trying to find out what's going on in our operations bee-wise. Yeah, cool. North Dakota is the number one honey producing state in the U.S. There are many beekeepers that bring their colonies out to North Dakota for the summer to make honey. And what a lot of them have been talking about is that the natural forage that the bees need to get good nutrition has been taken out and being replaced by corn and soybeans, which the bees don't use for food. They don't need the bees to pollinate them. A lot of the beekeepers I, I work with, they're concerned about the dust coming up and going over the bee colonies. If there was potential for the neonix uh, coating to create dust, where, where would that be? That would be uh, between the delivering system and into the hopper, uh, the corn seed being moved around, potentially loosening it up off the kernel. As you can kind of see with the seed disc, um, it'd have to be a fairly small piece of uh, a chip of a corn seed or a residue or something like that to be sucked through that seed disc which then would go through the seed and the vacuum tube and then out the exhaust side of the fan. I come from a farming background so I just thought it was really interesting to learn about how a corn planter works, these air seed planters, and I expected to see more, way more dust being exhausted out of the corn planter, and you know, honestly, I saw very little. I was pretty impressed on how efficient these planters are. That being said, we know that we're taking a risk because we know farmers are going to be using pesticides, and we understand that, but my hope is through this whole job swap, what are some of the things that we can look at where beekeepers can keep their bees healthy and farmers can keep their crops healthy and that we can both be sustainable in the long run? The history of honey production in North Dakota has been we have domestic hives or apiaries or, or, or beekeepers. And then we also have about 50% of the hives that come in to the state of North Dakota are from other states such as California and, and Texas. Some of those hives are undocumented. Those people that come in, uh, they don't register with the state of North Dakota. So there's no way of really knowing whose hives those are. Put it on like you're putting on a sweatshirt. My expectations on this job swap in meeting Randy is just to get a good understanding of how he runs his business. There's a responsibility when you run a business. It doesn't make a difference whether it's a farmer, a crop consultant, or a beekeeper. So when the beekeepers bring their hives into North Dakota, they need to have it documented with the state in order to be able to know where those hives are at. Because what we try to do is not spray when it's not needed, but when it's time to spray, we only have usually 24 to 48 hours to get those applications done. So it's the responsibility of the beekeeper, not just to drop his hives in North Dakota and disappear, but have somebody here that can address those management concerns. Get that out here, get that up there. We're trying to indoctrinate you, Carson. The empathy has got to be coming up a little bit. <laughs> no, the corn market went down today, so. <laughs> you haven't even met Mark hey, yet, Randy. Yeah, I have. Hey, Mark. How you doing? Hey, good to see you again. See you. Last time I seen you was like, what, 22 below over there yeah, in uh, Fargo? Yeah, Fargo at that meeting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this is uh, Carson? Yes, Clusterman. Matt. Okay, yeah. excellent, great. Our typical spring work is going through the hives and evaluating them, deciding what we need to do to get them ready for the coming honey production season. First uh, evaluation is just overall number of bees in the hive. If I've got wall-to-wall -wall bees covering all the frames, that's uh, strong. The queen is on that first frame. The queen is still on this frame here. These are just frames, and uh, each um, stack, if you were, 
would be called a hive or colony. So I told Katie this last year that my, my hives were better last summer than they'd been in a while. And I don't know if it's just the nature of the year or, or something else that is a little harder to pinpoint, but they were good. And so when they hit the ground here, better than they've been for a while. So at this point in the season, it's encouraging. But you never know how things may play out over the course of the year. It's just the nature of agriculture, uh, it, many unknowns. Speaking of agriculture, Mark, you know, I was out with Carson yesterday and uh, actually got to learn about planting some corn with an uh, air seeder. You know, I, I feel like we need to keep a fairly good relations with our farmers and we need to work with them. and. Uh, I think that's the type of re relationship we need to have with farmers, uh, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Um, we, I am here in this particular location by the good graces of the landowner that has this property, and that's how all of my locations are. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, I, I'm thankful to have each and every spot I have to, to, to place hives. And, and so I, I try to uh, you know, cooperate Mm -hmm. as best I can if if spray issues come up which they do mm -hmm. uh, I'd say generally in more recent times they've been good at contacting me and letting me know okay I need to spray these soybeans and your beehives are right next by mm -hmm. door to this this field mm -hmm. and I've been taking calls like that and generally we can figure something out uh, in most cases, I, I try to talk them into a different kind of spray if mm -hmm. I can. There's mm -hmm. some that are, are less harmful to the bees. And uh, if we can do that, then I, I don't have to move the bees or uh, screen them in or something like that, which are some of the other ways of trying to uh, prevent loss or reduce loss during spray applications. Randy's a good guy, very open to everything, easy to talk to, listens to both sides of the stories. I think today just really opened up a lot of eyes of how things are handled and uh, how the job all gets done. Yeah, I believe when Carson comes down to visit me and, and does that part of the job swap, I think uh, it's going to be hilarious. I'm not going to get stung one time when I'm down in Texas. Oh, he's going to get stung. <laughs> we'll make sure he's well protected. Hey, Carson. Top of the morning, Randy. Hey, man. Good to see you again. Yeah, been a while. Welcome to the swamp of Danbury. Well, I was going to say, uh, it's definitely a lot hotter here than it was in North Dakota when you were up visiting. Hey. Hey, Katie. Randy, good How's it going? Good, good. How are you? Greg, Greg. Good to see you. Yeah, good, good to see you. you. You bet. I see you wore the right kind of shirt for down here in the swamp. That's <laughs> smart thinking. So, you guys ready to go look at some bees and see what that's all about? Yeah, and I think that'll be a lot good. Yeah. See about getting some bee stings and... Oh, I didn't know about the bee sting. Yeah. <laughs> We're all suited up. We call that medication. <laughs> building over there. These are all of our bee locations right here, and uh, we have them on this map, and we have them color-coded, the different pins, depending on what we've done to the hives. And uh, the last thing we'll do is, after we've pulled the bees out of them and uh, shipped them up to North Dakota, We'll just pull the pin out and that way we know the yard is empty. What does this represent for the number of hives that you have out? This represents about 16,000 hives and we have anywhere from 80 to 128 up to 192 hives per location. Where do you want this stuff unloaded at, Randy? Um, well, just uh, take the uh, box of uh, acid boards and kind of go set them right there where that little opening is okay. and our 
our enemy number one is uh, the varroa mite, and we have to use pesticides ourselves as beekeepers. You know, we have varroa mites, we have viruses, we have uh, fungus, different things that, that are attacking the bees. You know, it's really a delicate balance because we're trying to kill a bug that's on a bug. Carson, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of smoke around the entrances to let the bees know that we're here and then I'm going to take the lids off. Now, because of all the rain, typically these should have been full, but they did, they did put honey in them. They just didn't fill them all the way up. We're taking the honey off of these bees here that they yep. made in Texas. And now we're gonna, after we've taken the honey off, we're gonna load these up on semis, ship them up to Bismarck, North Dakota, and put them around that area to make honey off of canola, sunflowers, alfalfa, sweet clover, buckwheat, and uh, whatever they have growing for us up because there. Because down here in Texas, there's really nothing left for the season. Exactly. Um, we're just here for the tallow tree and to build up our bees for the summer. Katie and Greg, I've been trying to find a varroa mite, but you know, fortunately we've been unsuccessful. You know, we found varroa mites at a higher levels than I ever expected last August, and, and using that information, I went right into treatment mode. They found that there is kind of a threshold that they've noticed, and what is that, Katie? Is it five mites per 300 uh, bees? Roughly three, yeah. Five per 300? Uh, three to five, yeah. Yeah. Per 300. If they get over five mites per 300 bees, that hive is dead. It just doesn't know it yet. Okay. okay. The winter of 2012 and, and 2013, I shipped 13,200 hives out to the almonds of California. We had a very good year. And so after you come after a year like that, you know, you think, man, I kind of got this thing figured out. You know, the very next year, uh, we only shipped 3,000 hives out to the, the almonds. And so that was pretty devastating because, you know, we lost a lot of bees that winter and the hives that were still alive, they were really weak. You just take it so personally. It's like somebody just punches you in the gut and you're just like, man, what did I do wrong? What could I have done different? And you just have to step back and regroup and, and uh, go for it again. From the beginning of the whole job swap, besides seeing a honeybee here or there, never really gave them much thought or dealt with them. I uh, seemed to have plenty of other things I needed to deal with. And everybody's got suspicions when you go into a project, how it's going to be slanted one way or the other. And I, through this whole deal, it's been awful neutral. There's been so much discussion and finger pointing on neonicotinoid pesticides. You know, I've been keeping bees up in North Dakota since 1994, and the first time I actually had bees up there on canola was probably 1997. And I have never seen any damage from neonicotinoids off of canola that I'm aware of. Neonicotinoids. Every time Randy says it, I think he always adds something in there, so I try to mimic him, but I don't know if he's right either when he says it. <laughs> the neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids. Yes, the neonicotinoids do have a similar pesticide base or chemical base as neonicotine. Ne now I can't say it. Nicotine. <laughs> Carson, right here is where they. Uh, little knives that cut the, the beeswax off the honeycombs to, yep. to open it up. You can see them going up the conveyor belt. So this, this is the first step? That's the first step. Get her set on her? Yeah, just don't get your fingers in between. Oh, ain't that easy. Yep, yep. And then they just get all separated, huh? There was a, a bet placed whether or not I'd get stung, and at the end of the day, I didn't get stung, so I'll have to find Randy and see if we can settle this uh, bet we made. I actually thought the bees would have been just a little bit more aggressive, and um, they actually weren't, so that kind of surprised me. I was a little disappointed because I really wanted him to get stung, 
and it didn't happen. So do you guys want to try some of the honey? Yeah. You make some good honey, Randy. Yes, I do. I think this project has changed me quite a bit in helping understand what the grower and the pesticide applicator's point of view is. Before this, I had very little experience in that part of agriculture. My main focus has been almost honeybees exclusively. So it's really, really interesting to hear their perspective on what they see as viable solutions and what's not. Last uh, time I was up in North Dakota, I left Carson's farm and flew out to Washington, D.C. to a Crop Life America meeting and spoke with them and basically had a lot of the same conversation where uh, beekeepers aren't adversarial and we just want to be looking for solutions and working on solutions and instead of pointing fingers and pointing blame. My role as a crop consultant is so grower focused. My, my production farmers that sometimes we kind of forget uh, what's going on on the, on the side, the periphery. And so I think as far as what I've, I've learned through this process is just being a greater awareness. Uh, but you know, I, we're all involved in production agriculture and I think a lot of times, you know, so many people are coming at us from different areas that we get fractured in what we're thinking and how we're approaching the you know, food production system. And, and I think that's, I gain a great appreciation for that. I think we're finding out that it's awful hard to put our finger on on one main cause and therefore it'll just take more dialogue and more working together to uh, uh, make everybody happy. The one thing with the bee industry is that we've kind of been on our own for many, many years where we've not had support from outside groups. The issue is too big for us to be dealing with it on our own. So by building these different partnerships, I'm really, I'm more hopeful for beekeeping.